geeks are going to have to uh, protect themselves. The port, one of the most important reasons to understand technology is to protect yourself. I mean, technology could be used against us just as easily as for us. Technology is, you know, morally neutral. And uh, I think as people who understand technology, it becomes really important for us to influence technology in the right direction and to stand up for ourselves. Governments could use tech, they don't right now because governments tend to be older, less savvy people. But what, imagine a government run by geeks. Uh, they could use technology to repress us far better than any government has ever used technology or ever repressed us. So it becomes really incumbent on us as people who understand technology to protect our freedoms using technology. I think that the freedom fighters, the, the, you know, the revolutionaries of the future are hackers, are the people who really understand technology. Because I promise you, you know, governments aren't going to stay old, slow, and in the way for very long. They're going to very quickly get savvy. And uh, it might not happen in my lifetime, but my kids' lifetimes, they're going to be just as savvy as we are. And it's going to be really important for us to understand and use technology to protect our freedoms. So that's number one. In fact, I've kind of lobbied for a rewriting of the Second Amendment. Instead of the right to bear arms, we should have the right to bear technology. You know, That's what they're going to try to do. And that's exactly what's happening. If you look at what big corp corporations are trying to do with net neutrality, they're trying to control the net. They're trying to make the net uh, a, a, a closed proprietary system for their own enrichment instead of the open uh, innovative uh, democratic system that it is today. We've got to be very active in defending that. Media is very, it's fundamentally undemocratic because the people who run and own the media, at least the mass media in the, in the earliest days of mass media, are the people who had the money. They're the oligarchs. They're the people who could afford a television station or a radio transmitter or a record studio. That's changed. Digital technology makes all of the means of production absolutely cheap. Look what I'm doing here for pennies compared to what Tech TV was doing. And you add that free global instant distribution via the internet, and these, these media moguls are completely disintermediated, which is a good thing because it, it was fundamentally undemocratic. So now media becomes a tool, a democratic tool that anybody can use. When I was in Dubai, I mean, my message to the to, to people who were at that TEDx conference was, we don't hear your stories. We hear the stories of Arabs as terrorists, as, as extremists. You've got to tell us, you've got to use new media to tell us your stories, and you have this great opportunity to do it. I mean, that's what new media is all about. It's, it's fundamentally democratic. And, uh, you know, the Paul Allens of the world are left holding nothing, you know? They're, the sand through their fingers. I have to go here. One of the frustrations I'd always had in mainstream media was that there's always the pressure to dumb it down and make it more accessible, right? And they have to because the, the economics dictate it. When we, even tech TV, which was in theory a channel aimed at, you know, geeks, um, it was so expensive to do. You know, it was 50 to 100 million dollars a year that in order for it to be economically viable, you had to reach an audience of millions. So they understandably were, were putting a lot of pressure on to make it more accessible. And so, you know, especially towards the end, as we were trying to gear up to sell the company and they wanted to make it look profitable, there, there was a lot of pressure to interview people like Kenny Rogers about his iPod. The thinking being, well, a name like Kenny Rogers is going to bring in an audience. But what it really does is it alienates the serious geeks, the ones who really care about the content. Uh, and it, frankly, it's not enough to bring in normal people to watch technology programming. I tried to pitch them all along on it, saying, you know, there's 14 million programmers in the U.S. You don't, you can get an audience of millions if you super serve the, the hardcore technology enthusiasts. But, you know, I guess understandably, they built essentially what was a brick and mortar business uh, in, an, in an internet age. So when I started doing what I'm doing, you know, our costs are way low, I'm pennies on the dollar. Fifty million dollars, I could run this channel for 50 years, no, a hundred years on this, you know. Uh, so uh, to me, I don't have that same pressure to generate massive audiences. I also have the strong belief that you, uh, especially in new media, do best serving, uh, super serving a niche audience. 
uh, because those people are more devoted to you. You know, and, and frankly, from a point of view of an advertiser, there's a lot more interest in an audience that's fully engaged in the programming than an audience that's kind of, well, yeah, I'm going to watch it, but wanders off to get a sandwich when the ad comes on. So I think we, do, even though we don't deliver an audience of millions, uh, we deliver an audience of hundreds of thousands, and those hundreds of thousands of people are in some ways more valuable to our advertisers than millions would be. They, they are paying attention to the advertising message. The messages are aimed at a particular audience. It's easier to say, we're going to buy, you know, put messages on that are aimed at this narrow slice. So I can make my programming smarter, which is, makes me happier because I don't have to explain what an MP3 is when I talk about it. Uh, makes the advertisers happier, and most importantly, it makes the audience happier. They're, they're treated like intelligent human beings instead of treated like the lowest common denominator. Nobody really likes, well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe you like a show or one show or another on TV, but nobody really likes TV in general. Everybody kind of thinks, yeah, TV in general is kind of dumb. You know, maybe there's one or two good shows that I really like, but most of it's kind of dumb. Everybody feels that way. And I don't, I don't think it should be that way. When, when you were one of three networks, you, hell yeah, you had a responsibility. You were given a huge amount of power. You were given the public airwaves. Uh, and there were, uh, it was a handful of people. Of course, the irony is it's fundamentally undemocratic. You know, I mean, it's, it's only uh, the most rich people who get to have a television network. So there isn't really a diversity of voices. It's undemocratic. And so, yes, they had a heavy responsibility. And no, they didn't live up to it. New media, I don't think you have the same responsibility because your responsibility is to be genuine and authentic and tell your story because everybody else gets to too. So there isn't that kind of burden of... I've got to, uh, you know, I've got to make sure I have a diversity or I serve, uh, you know, a broader audience. Or there's none of that. Your only responsibility is to to yourself to tell tell your story authentically, uh, which is great. It means that the content that is out on new media is much better content, in my opinion. We have audience numbers in a, three different ways. Uh, we have the audience that listens to the audio. Uh, you know, they download it and listen to it. That's by far the largest audience. We have the audience that watches live, the live stream, and starting in another few days, we're going to have an audience that downloads video. The smallest audience uh, right now is the, the live audience. Um, that varies, you know, almost at any time of the day, it's about 2,000 people. It goes, it peaks up at, on big events like um, Apple Keynotes or the 24 hours of iPhone to 10 to 15,000 people. Um, now that's small compared to Seinfeld numbers, um, small compared to Monday Night Football numbers, but not, truthfully not that small compared to typical cable television numbers. You know, at any given time on CNN, maybe there's a hundred thousand people watching. It's not, you know, it's not as big as you might think it is. Uh, and I think that as people get used to the idea that we're there, they learn about us, and they get used to the idea of watching television on the internet, I think those numbers are going to get much, much higher. The biggest audience, the, the audience that pays the bills, is the uh, podcast audience, the audio audience. And, uh, and uh, you know, our biggest podcast, which is This Week in Tech, is, you know, uh, it used to be a quarter of a million people. It's now about 175,000 people every show, which uh, is, a, again, a small number compared to network television, but a big number compared to podcasting. I think we're, I'm sure we're one of the top, you know, four or five podcasts out there. Um, other people give other numbers, but these are these numbers are highly vetted, unique IP addresses, um, and and so the, our numbers are a little bit more conservative. But I think that they're, but I can stand behind them. And certainly, advertisers require these kinds of highly vetted numbers. Uh, four and a half million downloads a month. Um, our, our reach, which is a number that's commonly used in uh, old media, is about five hundred thousand people a month. That's five hundred thousand uniques a month. So these are small numbers. But they're more than adequate uh, to pay the bills and, and, to, and to make a pretty good living. So uh, I'm very happy with it, you know. And I think those numbers will go up. We're, we're new media. That means we're new to a lot of people. And as, as, as we do a better job of getting the name out and the word out, I, I hope those numbers will go up.